Okay, everyone, welcome to 3-3. Now we're going to be talking about the actual anatomy of the arm, beginning to anyway. We'll be talking about the shoulder and the axilla, or also known as the armpit. So, uh, of course, this first slide is showing you some of the surface anatomy that's visible or that's palpable in the arm before any uh, dissection, of course. Uh, so the uh, shoulder has a number of joints to it. Um, it's not just the glenohumeral joint, which we think of primarily, but there are uh, two or three other joints. The sternoclavicular joint is actually the only point at which the upper limb articulates with the, um, the axial skeleton. Uh, so that's why the uh, clavicular fractures are so common with falls with outstretched arms and things like that, because all of the force of that fall has to go through the clavicle because that's the connection point to the rest of the body. Uh, there's also the acromioclavicular joint and the scapulothoracic joint. Uh, the scapulothoracic joint isn't actually a joint, it's a fascial plane uh, between the scapula and the thorax. Uh, so I hope you're already uh, realizing that with your knowledge of osteology that you've been studying since the, that first lecture, that all of these joints are simply named after the bones or ridges or, or uh, uh, prominences uh, and, and the, how they interact with each other. So the sternoclavicular joint is attaching from the sternum uh, and the clavicle. So these names, uh, you know, once you understand this, you don't need to memorize these things. So I hope none of you uh, try to make flashcards about these names because uh, that's going to be a waste of your effort. If you already know the osteology, you don't have to memorize these individual joints because you already have that knowledge. Just a, a pro tip. <clears throat> so here you can read about um, the sternoclavicular joint, the synovial joint, has a number of different um, uh, ligaments that uh, coordinate and, and restrict its movement. Uh, so these things are all important to know. Uh, this is just a matter of you spending the time with this information so that you uh, know, uh, know these things. But again, most of these ligaments are named after their attachment points. So um, it's not going to be that big of a problem, I hope. Uh, so we'll keep going through these slides. Um, the uh, cromioclavicular joint also has its coordinating collateral ligaments to it. Uh, so the acromioclavicular joint, um, uh, of course the acromion is named um, on the scapula because uh, in Greek the acromion means the highest point of the shoulder. Uh, it, the etymology is acrosomos uh, and we, uh, you know, kind of portman do that information together to uh, end up with acromion but the Greek means highest point of the shoulder, almost meaning shoulder. Uh, similarly, the coracoid process here, uh, anterior on the scapula, is named coracoid because that literally means uh, like a crow's beak, or beak-like, crow-like. Uh, so uh, this information, uh, you know, once you understand the osteology and the etymology of these terms, it becomes very natural. Okay, so then we get into the glenohumeral joint, which features this uh, large joint capsule. And there are thickenings of that joint capsule that form uh, the different ligaments that coordinate and restrict the movement of that joint. There's also a helpful ligament up here on its own, the uh, coracoacromial ligament, that restricts displacement of the humerus uh, uh, superiorly. So if there's a vertical force on the shoulder, uh, the, uh, the joint capsule doesn't have to um, uh, take and, and absorb all of that force. It is helped by the coracoacromial ligament. So for that reason, vertical shoulder displacement is uncommon. Now we're seeing a cross-sectional view. So we've taken the, sh the side of the shoulder and we've cut off the humerus and removed it and we're looking head on onto that shoulder. So left is posterior, right is anterior in this image. So now we can see um, more of the internal features of the glenohumeral joint. It's joint capsule, 
this, uh, the thickenings of the joint capsule as well as that uh, coracoacromial ligament above it. Something else that uh, restricts vertical displacement in this joint is actually the tendon of the long head of biceps brachii. It actually pierces through the joint capsule to attach to the supraglenoid fossa on the scapula. Uh, so in that way, biceps brachii long head is also going to restrict movement. <clears throat> so when we look at this joint capsule, we can begin to predict which direction on this uh, joint is going to be the weakest. We can see uh, all of those structures and except, so there's musculature on the back and on the front, there's musculature on top where there is not any uh, additional uh, restricting structures is on the bottom in a region called the axillary recess. So that axillary recess is actually a region where uh, there's no muscle or ligament, just the joint capsule. So that's why when individuals land flat on their shoulder, it tends to push the shoulder down uh, in the joint socket and displace, uh, dislocate that joint inferiorly. So let's take a look at the rotator cuff muscles that allow the movement of uh, this joint. So uh, we are looking at the right shoulder. So from uh, superior going counterclockwise, uh, we can form the acronym SITS based on the muscles that attach around this and, and uh, pass over this joint. So you can look at this supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, teres minor, and subscapularis, uh, as you can see appearing here on the slide, and you've got the slides yourself. So, uh, so here is a view with the humerus uh, in place and the joint capsule, um, uh, uh, you know, there uh, over the, the joint. And you can see again uh, all of these uh, portions of the tendon or the muscle bellies of all of these rotator cuff muscles. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the posterior view of the shoulder. And there are a couple important uh, neurovascular considerations in regard to these muscles here. And we can see the neurovasculature as some of this muscle has been windowed or reflected away. Uh, on the next slide, we can see a drawing that shows us the pathway of this neurovasculature. So first of all, on the top of the, mus uh, top of the scapula, there is a suprascapular notch. There's an imperfection in that scapular bone through which the suprascapular nerve and artery travel. So the, ner the nerve actually travels uh, below, uh, deep to a superior transverse uh, scapular ligament, whereas the suprascapular artery travels above on top of that ligament of the uh, suprascapular notch. And then uh, those structures head around the spine of the scapula uh, to supply the infraspinatus muscle. And so you're seeing a pattern here. There's a supraspinatus muscle and an infraspinatus muscle, and they're named based on their relation to the spine of the scapula. So again, these names uh, tend to make sense. <clears throat> Along the medial border, of the scapula, you will find the dorsal scapular nerve and artery. <clears throat> so uh, now with those two uh, areas out of the way, let's look at the spaces that the scapular muscles uh, form here. So there's three different spaces, the triangular space, uh, the triceps hiatus, and the uh, quadrangular foramen. So take a look at those, uh, it's important that you'll be able to identify what neurovasculature is within those spaces because those are going to form landmarks for you in your dissection as well as understanding the pathway these nerves take so you can use that information diagnostically to determine where a patient was most likely injured if they have defects uh, or muscle weaknesses or uh, dermatome sensory problems for instance. So here you can take a look also at these um, 
table of movements of the scapulothoracic joint. Uh, so complex movements on this very free-floating and mobile uh, scapula. Um, so this is that kinesiology information and showing you what muscles predominate in those movements. <clears throat> so now let's move on to the uh, axilla or the armpit. So here we've taken a cross section right through the uh, pectoral muscle right below the uh, uh, the glenohumeral uh, the uh, glenoscapular um, joint. Uh, so um, here we can see uh, that this region contains the passage for a large number of braided nerves, arteries, and veins that supply the upper limb. So the boundaries of the axilla, this, tri this um, triangular pyramidal um, uh, shape, triangular prism shape, uh, is uh, listed here anteriorly the pectoralis, uh, major and minor muscles, posteriorly subscapularis and lat dorsi, uh, serratus anterior on the thoracic wall, uh, and then the humerus laterally. <clears throat> so this armpit uh, pyramidal shape region um, has additional boundaries, a superior boundary and an inferior boundary. So the first rib is as high as the axilla goes uh, and the uh, inferior boundary is teres major. As teres major crosses, that's what we consider the end of the axilla, and you can palpate your teres major with your arm extended, and that's the lowest point of your armpit. So within that region is the axillary artery. <clears throat> so the axillary artery, we divide it up into three portions uh, for convenience sake. There's a portion of the axillary artery between the first rib and um, the um, pectoralis minor muscle, and that is called the proximal portion. There's a region deep to pectoralis muscle, that's called the deep portion, and there's a distal portion between teres uh, major and, uh, or, or um, teres uh, major and the um, pectoralis minor muscle, and that's the distal portion. After uh, that distal portion is done, that artery is the same artery, but it changes its name to brachial artery. <clears throat> so in each region of this axillary artery, we will find different branches that supply different regions of the axillary uh, uh, portion and, and the arm as well as the side of the thorax. So it's important to know these different names of these arteries and ultimately what they're supplying. Now, all that information is provided here as well as in your anatomy atlas. <clears throat> And so, uh, moving through these slides, I've highlighted uh, all of these different arteries and their important locations. And then some of these branches uh, that are coming off the axillary artery, we see again in the spaces on the posterior view of the shoulder. So, uh, important to understand the pathway that these arteries end up taking. So, when you do the dissection, uh, well, real, um, you know, uh, individual. This is more what that area looks like than the previous drawing. Uh, so you can see the axillary artery here with the individual um, branches highlighted coming off of those regions. So this drawing came from your uh, Anatomy Atlas book. So you can take a look at it in more detail in that book. Uh, you can also see how the nerves that enter the upper limb are braided around the axillary artery and so that becomes more important as we start to identify uh, these different branches of nerves in the axillary region. Before we end this lecture, because uh, so many of these structures are related um, to the neck region, I want to give you a quick overview of the posterior region of the neck. So the posterior region of the neck is a triangular uh, uh, region uh, its anterior border is the posterior edge of sternocleidomastoid. Posterior border 
is the anterior edge of trapezius muscle. Its inferior border is the clavicle. And within this region, we're gonna find a number of cutaneous nerves coming out of a, a location called Herb's Point. We are also, once we begin to dissect deeper, so these nerves coming out of Herb's Point uh, provide sensation to different regions of the neck uh, and the head. Uh, so, and as well as the, um, the superior thoracic region. Uh, so these nerves are important to know. You'll also find the accessory nerve uh, within this location. As we go deeper, you cannot, oh, there it is uh, located there. So accessory nerve, as you know, is innervating the trapezius muscle. So you'll find it in the upper portion of the posterior triangle heading to the deep side of trapezius muscle. So this brings up an important point, which will have implications later. Nerves always innervate muscles, except for a, a handful of exceptions. Nerves always innervate muscles proximal and deep. So the nerve is going to give off its motor branches to a muscle as close as it can, as proximal as it can. And it's also going to do this on the deep side of the muscle belly, not on the superficial side, because uh, this protects those motor neurons and allows uh, the um, conservation of the energy needed to extend that action potential and to extend that nerve axon uh, even farther for no particularly good reason. If it can innervate it closer, it's going to. And so that's true here of that accessory nerve. As we go deeper, now we begin to see some of the musculature of the neck and the superior um, uh, or the uh, levator scapulae muscle, which I've highlighted here on this slide. Also important to note is the uh, brachial plexus between the middle and anterior scalene muscles. The brachial plexus is that woven structure of nerves around the axillary artery that ends up supplying the, um, the muscles and the skin of the upper limb. <clears throat> we will also be able to find, uh, here it is, phrenic nerve running across the top of the scalene muscles. Phrenic nerve, a very small nerve, so we'll see it quite clearly. It will be a landmark for us when we actually get to the dissections. And then, uh, so I've highlighted it there. It does not come out of Herb's point, but it's near Herb's point. And then the uh, inferior belly of Omohyoid is gonna cross over top of the brachial plexus. And that's it for this lecture. Thank you very much.